Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract one. Extract one. Questions one to twelve. You hear a rheumatologist talking to a patient called Harry Davis, who suffers from gout and is attending for a medication review. The questions one to twelve complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Now, Mr.、Uh, Davis,、yep. I understand your GP has referred you to me so that we can review the medications you're taking for your gout. That's right. So,、um, tell me a bit about this gout.、Uh, when did it start? Well, my first serious attack was last year. My wife and I were on holiday, and I woke up one morning with a really bad pain in my left knee. Well, I never thought of gout because I always assume that just happens somewhere like your big toe. And anyway, I'm only forty. I thought it was something only old people get. So anyway, it was all red and swollen, and I decided it must be an insect bite. But I couldn't think how that might have happened, you know, without me feeling something at the time. Or my wife suggested it might be something to do with the pills I take for my cholesterol. Uh, unlikely, I think. <laughs>、mm. But anyway, the pain didn't get any better. In fact, quite the opposite. I started to get frightened because I thought it might be a sign of something really serious. It was excruciating. So, my wife thought I needed to get some help. So she phoned the local clinic and told them about my symptoms. They told her to bring me in. It was a good thing she was there. I was in too much pain to drive. I mean, I could only just manage to walk from the house to the car. <laughs> anyway, when we got there, the doctor took a look and said he wanted to take a blood sample. He said it might be an emergency because it looked as if it could be septicemia.、Hmm. So then we got really frightened. But about an hour later, they came back and said no, it wasn't. Thankfully, but they thought I had gout. So actually, at that stage, we were quite relieved. Yeah, I can imagine. And the doctor asked if I'd ever felt anything like it before. Well, actually, then I remembered that in the winter I play quite a bit of rugby, and sometimes I'd get some soreness in the same place the day after. But I just thought I'd sprained it or something, and it would go away after a couple of days. But this pain's much worse, and it comes even when I've been resting. I've had it quite a few times since my first attack. Right. So, what have you been taking to deal with the pain? Well, at first, the doctor at the clinic suggested I took some anti-inflammatories, but I can't say they made much difference.、Mm. So, when I got the next attack, I was at home, and I went to my GP. She suggested I took. Uh, I can't remember the name. A、uh, col something. A、uh, colchicine. That's the one. So that dealt with the pain better, but it gave me awful diarrhoea. Yeah. I'd never take it again. And then I had a really bad attack. I think the doctor had got to the stage where, you know, she was already giving me really powerful medicines to no effect. So she gave me liquid morphine to take. It made me feel quite sick, actually,、mm. and I was a little bit、um, away with the fairies, you know.、Mm. Walking around, not quite knowing where I was. Right.、Uh, did you try any other sort of treatment apart from the medications? Yes. My GP said I could try using an ice pack, and that did make a bit of difference. But you can't have it on all the time. So anyway, after that, she said, "Let's try、um, aloe purinol.、Uh, see how you get on with that."、Hmm. So I started taking that, but I didn't get on with it. It gave me a skin rash, so I rang her up, and she told me to stop taking it. That I'd better see a specialist. So here I am. <laughs> Is there anything more you can do? Well, I'm sure we can find something. Maybe a combination.
Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a doctor in an emergency department talking to a patient called Gail Kennedy. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Mrs. Kennedy? Yes. I'm Dr. Jarvis. Hello. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Okay. Now, um, can you tell me what's brought you here today? Well, I got back from holiday two weeks ago, and I've been feeling awful ever since. It was a long-haul flight because we'd been to South America, oh. and when I got back I felt awful. I thought it must be jet lag, but brutal. Much worse than I remember having before. Anyway, I thought I'd get over it, but... It actually got worse. After a few days, I was getting bad chills and non-stop shivering and achy muscles. I just felt lousy. Hmm. I mean, it, normally I'm pretty healthy. I don't get a lot of illnesses. So I started to worry. I thought maybe I got meningitis. Right. So I rang the doctor. When I told him where I'd been, he said I should come in and see him because it might be malaria. So I said, well, it can't be because I've been taking malarone. I started on that two weeks before going away. Uh -huh. I tried um, oh, uh, larium yeah. uh, a few years ago, but it gave me really odd dreams, so I didn't want to take that again. Anyway, the doctor said some sorts of malaria are resistant to these drugs, and I know I did get a few bites when we were there. He gave me some pills to take for three days, just in case it was malaria. Right. Can you tell me what they were? Oh, um, art something. Ah, uh, tesunate. That's right. And uh, something else. Hang on, I've got the box here. Uh, mefloquine. Ah, uh, OK. So uh, I went home and I took the pills, but I didn't feel any better. In fact, I got worse. I felt really weak, and I was sweating buckets, just dripping with it. I finished the pills yesterday morning. Uh, since then, I've been really bad. I haven't been able to keep anything down. I was throwing up all day yesterday and had the most splitting headache. I've never had anything like it. Mm. So I rang the doctor again, and he said the blood test had come back negative. But if I wasn't feeling better today, I should come into the emergency department and get some more tests done. Right. Well, I'll just do a brief examination. OK. To pop over there. OK, so your skin's a good colour. I can't see any sign of jaundice. And your breathing's sounding pretty good. You haven't had any episodes of breathlessness, have you? No. But uh, yesterday, my heart was really racing. Yes, there is some evidence of that now. And uh, um, something else. All this week, I felt as if there was something scratchy in my eyes, like sand or something, and they feel really dry. Mm, I see. Uh, and have you had any abdominal discomfort? Well, there's no pain, but I don't have any appetite. I can't really keep anything down, like I said. Right. Now, apart from taking the anti-malarials, did you have any vaccinations before you went away? Yeah, I had all the injections. Uh, typhoid and what else? Um, oh, not yellow fever, because I'd already had that before. Mm. Uh, but I did have one for um, hepatitis A. Yeah. And uh, they were fine. I don't usually have any problems with things like that. Then, uh, while we were away, I, I did get cold sores all over me upper lip. I've had them before, and I'd got some over-the-counter stuff for them, so I just used that. Right. Uh, apart from that, I was fine during the holiday. I'm normally very healthy. Uh-huh. I, I did have um, breast cancer a few years ago. That was in 2011. I had a lumpectomy, uh, so I was taking some Oxifem for five years. But I don't have to take it now. Okay. So, it's possible that this might be a reaction to certain drugs, oh. but we'll need to do some more tests first. Right. 
That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a patient talking to a dental receptionist. Now read the question. Hi, I'd like an urgent appointment, please. Let's see, who's your usual dentist? Mr Garcia. You say it's urgent. Are you in pain? Yeah, it's the tooth Mr Garcia filled last week. Well, he's away today, I'm afraid, but there's a free slot this afternoon with his colleague Mrs Brown. Uh, well, that'd be OK, but are you saying Mr Garcia could fit me in tomorrow? That's right, we'd get you in first thing. Can you wait? Well, I'm not chewing on that side and I'm taking paracetamol, which is helping. Mm -hmm. The pain started when I was eating a steak, so I'm frightened I might have upset Mr Garcia's work. It makes sense for him to check it out. OK, we'll book you in for tomorrow morning at 10. Question 26. You hear part of a presentation to nursing staff about an extension to visiting hours. Now read the question. Now, you'll have received the survey asking your opinion about extending visiting hours and doubtless you've got your own ideas about the possible impact on your work. You're probably aware of the evidence pointing to the positive effects on patient recovery rates of increased contact with loved ones. This isn't in question, but of course things must be managed properly. I've heard concerns about how busy everyone is, that you've got enough on your plates without having to worry about extra demands from visitors. Well... We've carefully planned things to prevent you being overrun with queries, interruptions and so on. Visitors will be given a list of do's and don'ts outlining what's expected of them. Meanwhile, managers will be monitoring things carefully to make sure routines aren't disrupted at all. Question 27. You hear a surgeon discussing a patient with a nurse in the recovery ward. Now read the question. It looks like Mrs Jones is still a bit groggy after her thyroidectomy. Uh, will she be going up to the ward soon? Yes, I'm going to call a porter. She should be going up in 15 minutes. OK. Uh, I've added some extra post-op pathology orders. Uh, she may have problems with the drop in her calcium. Her thyroid was just huge. Uh, we didn't see all four parathyroid glands, and we need to check that they haven't been affected by the procedure. She seems okay, but I want her calcium level checked twice a day. Uh, she needs to be monitored for any breathing problems, <laughs> muscle cramping and numbness, and for tingling in her fingers. Okay, I'll make sure a report to watch out for hypercalcemia is passed on. Okay, if you need me, call me. Question 28. You hear a chiropractor briefing a colleague about a patient called Ryan. Now read the question. Today we're going to start with Ryan. He's two weeks post-surgery for a torn rotator cuff. He also had a spur on his acromion process removed. 
Uh, this is his first time in rehab post-surgery, I believe. That's correct. Okay, so today we're going to begin utilizing high-frequency vibration to break up the scar tissue forming in his left shoulder joint following the surgery. We're going to do each of his treatments that way, so you'll see a progression over time, how we get him back to a point where he's able to live his normal life. Movement's the key to rehabilitation, and this treatment resonates with the nerves, too, so it should eventually help them heal quicker and reduce his discomfort. Question 29. You hear a surgeon talking to a group of medical students about patient risk in emergency surgery. Now read the question. If you look at the risks of elective surgery, they're really very low compared to emergencies. Clearly, then, we can make the biggest difference in reducing risk and improving outcomes in emergency surgery. Our mortality outcomes here are actually below average. We're at 8% compared to around 13% nationally. The emergency patients I handle tend to be older, so they're at higher risk. And when they come in... We haven't got long to prepare them in order to reduce any risks, maybe an hour or two. In terms of patient safety, every minute, every half hour we can use to get them ready counts. That's because the patients we're thinking about are prone to developing post-operative complications, given that they have a range of associated heart, kidney, and lung problems. Question 30. You hear a surgeon talking to a patient who's just had a knee operation. Now read the question. How are you feeling, Mr. Shaw? Oh, exhausted. But the painkillers must be working. I, I can't feel my knee as you predicted. You're bound to feel weary after an operation. It went well, though. We cleaned out loose cartilage from the joint. You can go home now. Oh, thanks. I had an arthroscopy on the other knee several years ago, so I know what it's like. The idea that it gets done in less than a day is still pretty mind-boggling, though. Hmm. Uh, you'll need crutches for two weeks, mm -hmm. but you should be walking okay within a month. I'm good. Give it four months before you put any serious impact on it, though. Four months? Uh, after my last stop, I started running again within a month. Uh-uh. Thinking about it, though, <laughs> I guess I paid for it. That knee had a lot of niggles for months afterwards. Yeah, if your body's hurting, it's telling you something. Okay. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A. B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with Dr. Helen Sands about her work with patients who are learning to cope with amputation. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
I'm joined today by Dr. Helen Sands, who works with patients who've had limbs amputated. Now, amputation is an extremely traumatic experience for patients. Helen, in your experience, how do younger patients tend to react to it? Well, in a range of ways, depending on whether the loss was expected, if it was due to chronic illness, or to something sudden like an accident. One of my young patients in that situation, uh, let's call him David, said losing his legs suddenly was like the pain of an unexpected death in the family. Hmm. And although this didn't really apply to him, for many young people, even watching a football game can make them feel shut out of activities they once took for granted. But then others come to terms with the fact that for them, normality will be something different from what it was before the operation. And patients can still suffer pain from a missing limb, can't they, even after the limb has been amputated? what's called phantom limb syndrome. Mm -hmm. How common is this? Well, the phenomenon was first observed many years ago in soldiers who'd lost a limb in combat. The majority reported pain coming from the missing limb. Obviously, surgical techniques have improved, but a large number of amputees still report suffering from a degree of pain from the missing limb. In a few instances, this might be due to a poorly fitting prosthetic, for example, or residual limb pain. But the majority of cases are harder to explain. Mm. And patients are reluctant to talk about it in case medical professionals doubt their mental state. So it's not very easy to say just how often it occurs. However, I still tend to think it's large numbers. And you must have come across examples of this phantom limb syndrome in your own patients who have missing limbs. Oh, yes, of course. Many patients report feeling as if the missing limb is still attached to their body, even years after the amputation. Some patients have reported actually trying to use it just as they did before. And in the case of other patients, they feel as though the missing limb is permanently at an abnormal angle, and they have to make allowances for it when moving around. Hmm. I've come across a number of instances of that. And other patients experience what we call telescoping, the sensation that the limb is still there as normal, but it's become smaller, shrunk somehow. And I understand that you have a treatment trial going on in the hospital at the moment. Well, yes. I mean, in the normal course of treatment, we administer analgesia, and we also make use of local injection therapy using pain-blocking agents, Unfortunately, though, these don't always work as well as we might like. So we're working with a group of patients who have reached the point where the pain's badly affecting normal activities, such as sleeping and going to work. All patients in the group have suffered from phantom limb pain for 10 years on average. So they're the most extreme cases we could find. Hmm. So how did you set about treating the patients in the trial group? Well, when a limb is lost, that affects a number of brain functions, and we wanted to try to restore those functions. Mm -hmm. So we attached electrodes to the remaining muscles of the stump and then asked patients to try to move the phantom limb. And patients could view their virtual limb moving on a computer, but they couldn't just imagine moving the limb. They actually had to force their brain, if you like, to perform the action because only then would these circuits, these pathways, be restored in their brains. Huh. So the patient controlled the virtual limb just as they would have with their own limb. And slowly, they got better at doing this in a way that was productive to the brain. And patients invariably reported that as a result, their pain diminished. So the treatment was useful. Mm -hmm. Does it have any other advantages? Well, we followed up patients after different periods of time, and the improvements were still there, but not to the same degree. But the decrease in pain levels was still statistically significant. But this kind of treatment is very easy for patients to do at home once they've left the hospital. They only need a computer with a webcam and the program. And this research is ongoing, of course, so we can look in the... Now look at extract 2. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear a dermatologist called Dr. Jake Cooper talking about a skin condition called hydrodonitis suppurativa, HS. 
You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, my name's Jake Cooper, I'm a dermatologist, and I'm going to talk about a skin condition called Hydrodenitis suppurativa, commonly abbreviated to HS. Let me tell you a bit about this condition. HS is a chronic inflammatory disorder characterized by painful swollen lumps on the skin, which may break open, releasing fluid or pus. It's also called acne inversa, and in fact, Sufferers often think they've got acne or pimples. But unlike acne, HS affects apocrine gland-bearing sites, in particular the armpits and the pubic regions. It's not a very well-known disease in the medical community, which is surprising, as it affects about 1% of the population, and early occurrences are commonly misdiagnosed as simple nodules or abscesses. This is unfortunate, as the condition can be very distressing for the patient. We don't know exactly what causes HS, though it seems to be linked to blocking of the hair follicles in the affected area. It tends to occur most often in younger females, and it's often found in patients who are overweight. Studies carried out into a possible link between deodorant use and HS have so far been inconclusive, but the condition is more prevalent amongst smokers, and there's some evidence that nicotine may affect the follicles. Patients sometimes worry that they've caused the condition by shaving, or possibly by using depilatory creams, but there's no evidence that either is a contributing factor. Let me tell you about one case I encountered recently. This was a 22-year-old woman called Sophie, who came to see me because she had a number of painful boils in her groin, these had been occurring with fluctuating severity for the previous three years. When I questioned her further, I learned that she'd previously undergone incision and drainage of various lesions on multiple occasions at various medical centres. She also told me that she'd taken a course of an unknown oral antibiotic to treat an abscess about two months earlier. So I was able to put two and two together and make a connection with HS. Then we could start to think about the right sort of long-term treatment for her. When treating patients with HS, it's important to be aware of the impact it can have on them. Many studies have confirmed that patients with HS commonly experience depression as a result of their condition. Additionally, HS has a significant psychosocial impact. Patients reported feeling unworthy and unlovable, and described their lesions as ugly, smelly, and embarrassing. In some cases, symptoms may spontaneously resolve themselves for long periods of time, but both doctor and patient need to remember that there could be a flare-up years or even decades later, and that currently, treatment is limited to finding a way to manage the condition. HS may present itself in younger patients too. In another case, I saw a 14-year-old girl called Emily 
who came to see me with her mother following a diagnosis of HS by her GP. We needed to confirm the diagnosis and decide on the most appropriate treatment. Her mother expressed concerns about what she referred to as Emily's unappealing hygiene. <laughs> This was said in front of the girl. Now, we know that HS is notably not due to poor hygiene. While HS is a skin disease, it's happening lower in the dermis than just the surface level. In this case, Emily had a lesion on the mons pubis, which required surgical intervention. Following incision and drainage, her condition improved, but this does illustrate the need to consider not just the patient, but also the attitude of family members. In general, when it comes to treatment, once we make a diagnosis, there are multiple therapies indicated, depending on the severity of the disease and patient presentation. One thing patients often ask me is whether they need to make changes to their diet. One small-scale study followed 12 HS sufferers who cut out beer from their diet, together with other foods containing yeast, such as bread and some types of cake. And this did appear to have an effect on their symptoms. It's also known that overproduction of one group of hormones called androgens may contribute to the symptoms of HS. These hormones are linked to insulin, and foods such as milk and cheese can raise insulin levels. So reducing these types of foods might be helpful. However, a controlled diet, which leads to weight loss, is certainly recommended for patients who are overweight or obese. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.